Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Mark chapter 7, verses 1. The Bible says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain scribes which came from Jerusalem. And the Bible says, And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Are you following me? And for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, eat not holding the tradition of the elders. And so, now I want to submit to you that this washing of hands was more traditional than hygienic. Some of you, you have used this to refuse to washing hands when you're going to eat. I rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Some of you say, ah, even Jesus' disciples didn't wash. No, no, no. The ceremonial washing of the Jewish culture, they used to wash their hands up to the ankles, eh? like the Muslims do uh, wudu, you know? So it, it, was, it was more of a ceremonial thing than a hygienic thing. And I mean that Jesus is against hygiene, eh? Some of you, you just get your mud dirty hands and say, ah, the disciples, then you put in the mouth. No, 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 that's not it. So, when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen and vessels and of tables. Verse 5, and the Pharisees and scribes kept asking Jesus Christ, why do your disciples not order their way of living according to the tradition handed down, by the forefathers to be observed, but eat with hands unwashed and ceremonially not purified. And he said unto them, Excellently and truly, so there will be no room for them to blame. He says, Did Isaiah prophesy of you, the pretenders and hypocrites, as it stands written, these people constantly, listen, honor me with their lips, but their hearts hold off and are far distant from me. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far distant from me. Next verse. And the Bible says, in vain, now listen, fruitlessly and without profit, they worship me. Jesus called it vain worship. Vain worship. Worship that is useless. Praise God. And ordering and teaching to be obeyed as doctrines, the commandments and precepts of men. Verse 8 says, you disregard and give up and ask to depart from the commandment of God and cling to the tradition of men, keeping it carefully and faithfully. For Moses said, honor, revert. He gave, now he gave an example. He says, you guys hold on to tradition so passionately. Then he gave an example. He says, Moses said, honor, revert with tenderness of feeling and deference. Your father and your mother, and he who curses or reviles or speaks evil or abuses or treats improperly his father or mother, let him surely die. This was the Lord telling them, right? But as for you, you say, a man is exempt if he tells his father or his mother, what would you do otherwise have gained from me everything I have that would have been of use to you is Coban, that is, is a gift already given as an offering to God. And Jesus asked them, then you are no longer permitting him to do anything for his father or mother, but are letting him off from helping them. And as thus you are nullifying and making void of no effect the authority of the word of God through your tradition, which you in turn hand on, and then many things of this kind you are doing. Okay, English semantics, back to common language. The first experience, disciples have refused to wash their hands ceremonially, like it was that a man was not supposed to eat without washing hands a certain way. And then these guys are asking Jesus, how be that your disciples, they just do stuff the way they want. You understand what I'm saying? And because they're not honoring the code of the traditions that were handed over 
by our forefathers. And then Jesus is saying, look, you have a form of vain worship. Your lips are worshiping God, but your hearts are very far because you are speaking more of tradition than revelation. You're seeking to exalt traditions of men and the teachings of men above the word of God. And in the second attempt again now, Jesus gives them an example. He says, you yourselves say that honor your father and your mother, revive them. It's teaching, according to the Mosaic teaching. But the same way, sometimes you do not care for your parents and give excuse that the things that I would have given you, I gave to Coburn. And he says, aren't you contradicting yourself for the same person who knows you're supposed to do this to your parents, but you're not doing it because at one point you're going to say, oh no, what I was supposed to give you, I gave into the temple. Okay. When the Bible says, honor your father and mother, okay? Let me first mention this clearly for some of you to understand this. When the Bible says, honor your father and your mother, huh? if you see Jesus asking them, how be it that the times when you are supposed to give them what belongs to them, you say, everything that I'm supposed to give you was a gift into the temple of God. When they're talking about honoring your father and your mother, they're also talking about you giving them some money. It's not about... No, 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 no. Look after them financially. Tell your neighbor, look after your father and mother financially. That's called honor. Some of you, when was the last time you bought your mother a shoe? I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Some of you, you've never bought your mother anything. Buy your mother something. Praise God. So, it's honor to look after your parents. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's honor to look after your parents. Now, Jesus is telling them, look, God is not saying don't bring in the temple. He's only saying of your increase every year, there is a portion for your parents. It's, it's obvious. Don't even debate it. Some of you, your salaries are you, your children, your temple. No, no. The tithe is good. Give the offering. Partner with us. It's wonderful. But always keep a portion for your parents. Always do. Always do. It's the teaching of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, Mark chapter 7 is introducing us to one of the biggest problems that we have in the body of Christ today. Albeit, of course, some of you might not appreciate it, but by the end of service, you'll have a very sheer appreciation of the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that we have in the body of Christ today. Traditions and teachings of men replacing the teaching and revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's many things in the church, in the body of Christ, Jesus, of the body of Jesus, the believers, the Christ them, that are not biblical, they are not revelational, they are not scriptural, they carry no distinct stand in scripture, but they are simply funny what? Traditions. The Greek word there is paradosis. They are simply traditions. They are not revelation, they are traditions. I was studying this whole thing called traditions, the Greek word paradosis. And something intrigues me, that in the New Testament Greek, there are 2,000 nouns. How many of you know that? Okay, now you know. There are about 2,000 nouns in the Greek language. Right? And there are only two nouns that are close to the same numerical value of Revelation 13, 3, 4, 6, 8. And amazingly, Traditions, the word tradition, paradosis, is the noun which carries a numerical value, triple six, the six, six number. You remember how it says in Revelation, and he that he has ears and understanding, let him understand that this number is of a, the number triple six is the number of a man which is a beast. For some of you who understand eschatology, the teaching of the end times, the things that shall come in the last times, many of you know that there shall come a manifestation of one guy called the beast, right? And they shall come coded under the numerical number 666. And it's almost as though it's not by accident that this paradosis, the negative kind, traditions of men, not the tradition of Christ, but the traditions of men, I almost think, and this I stand to be corrected by those of you who read deeper, but I'm starting to think that the biggest manifestation of the beast of the Antichrist, like is known in Scripture, shall be through the exchange 
of the revelation of the person of God in two traditions of men. There is nothing that departs off the faith of men like the traditions that people have engaged in in the body of Christ. That today people no longer even think through the things that were handed over to them. They think that as long as it was handed over, therefore it is revelation. But it is not so. And that is why I think my biggest concern is that the Antichrist will likely manifest through traditions in the church of Jesus. It will mean, of course, like for example, some of you know church history, that when the gospel entered Rome, in the Roman Empire, it became a political affair. There are many traditions in the Roman Catholic, and I'm not abusing if you're Roman Catholic here, that are not in the Bible. You're using a rosary, you don't know where it came from. You're doing things, you don't even know where they came from. You're burning incense, but you don't even know where it came from. But you're doing it, and it's translated to you, it's, it's going into generations and generations. My fear is that as Christianity takes on that course to take on the traditions of men, some people will wake up worshipping the devil instead of worshipping God and they will not know because the word of God is made void of its effect when men put tradition above the revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Shout hallelujah. Galatians 5.9 says that a little living, give me the amplified of that. He says, and a little living, a slight inclination to error, or a few false teachers, leavens the whole lamp. What does it say? It perverts the whole conception of faith or misleads the whole church. Little, little small things can mislead the church of Jesus. It only needs to be a big error. It only needs to be an error. It can be the smallest divergence. It can only be the small little thing that goes off from divine truth. And that can lead to the destruction of many souls. And lies like you can never count. Because some people think, ah, no, that's a small error. It can be handled. No, that's a little thing. Listen, when Satan made Eve fall, when Satan misled Adam and Eve, many of you do not know that he simply twisted the word and made it say what it was and say. And guess what? Adam and Eve fell. Up to this day, men are dying because of slight errors. God tells them, you shall eat of every tree in the garden, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan comes and tells Eve, has the Lord said that she shall not eat of any fruit of, of every tree? He twists scripture a little and deception begins. Some people have died because of deception. Families have been separated because of deception. People have been destroyed because of deception. Some of you, you're stuck and powerless because you have embraced traditions about the revelation of Jesus. You're doing things you don't even know why you're doing them, but it's vain worship. What God calls vain worship means that you're going to go to church all your years. You're going to go to the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, and all these kinds of people. You're going to sit under every ministry. You're going to serve. You're going to do everything. But at the end of the day, some people stay where they are. Nothing changes about their life. It is vain worship because even in the understanding and revelation of God, it is not according to truth and the person of Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture, but it is according to the doctrines and the teachings of men. Are you following me? Now we have a problem. If these traditions only were only delaying us, that would be understandable. But they make the Word of God void of its power. That means that the Word of God has power. He says, you are nullifying and making void and of no effect the authority of the Word of God through your tradition, which you in turn hand on and many things of this kind you are doing. That means the Word of God is in your life, but it does not have effect. Because within there, when we start looking in, we realize that there is living in what is supposed to be unliving. There's a little error and deception that looks like healthy compromise. But it's not healthy. You call it healthy because it doesn't directly have an effect on you as it appears. But in its own, it's the very reason why the word of God does not have effect in your life. Because you have embraced traditions above revelation. There are things over the years we have been convinced to believe. We didn't think through these things. And these are the things some of you are suffering over. Very small things that are deluding men into inexcusable errors and the church is getting destroyed every other day 
small statement. For example, let me give you a small example. Somebody's driving. Hmm? Then he sees a big building. He says, eh, that man built a big church. What is a church? Who told you that the church is a building? You, you understand what I'm saying? Does God dwell in buildings built by men's hands? No. Even when David was telling God, he says, I want to build a place where your name shall be praised. The place for your name. Not your person. God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. He dwells in you and I. You are the church of Jesus Christ. You can have a big church yet without a building. And you can have a very big building yet without a big church. There are people with very big buildings, but the church is small. And there are people with very big churches, but the building is small. And there are people who think the church is a building. Who told you? Let me give you one more example maybe to understand this. One time I was talking to somebody who says, um, I was a missionary for five years, and for me the lights went off already. The man said he was a missionary. By what tradition and teaching in scripture has made you think or assume that you are a missionary because you've gone th a thousand miles away from where you live? People, we are going on mission. Listen, mission is a lifestyle. I'm a missionary right now. Hallelujah. It's not based on location. Some people think that when they live here and then they go to Mbali, they say, we went on a mission to Mbali one time. No. You have a mission in Kampala. Somebody shout hallelujah. You have a mission at your workplace. You're a missionary where you work. You're a missionary in your own household. You're a missionary where you live. You're a missionary in your own neighborhood. Missionary is a mandate. It is not based on location or a definitive period of being sent by men. Are you following me? But do you know how many people say, let us fund this missionary? Listen, you're also a missionary. Maybe you can say, let's fund this brother who goes many miles away. That's better. But we're all missionaries. Somebody say, I'm a missionary. Say again and say, I'm a missionary. Are, are you following what I'm saying? Now, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul realizes that there was a problem in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem had embraced Judaism. And Judaism was the cradle. It was the breeding place of traditions. Those men could do anything for the sake of tradition. They could kill for tradition. Some of you, I think, have read the story in the book of Acts chapter 6 about uh, Stephanus, Stephen. The Bible tells us that he was seized and arrested. And some of these guys told guys to accuse him that he's blasphemous. He's blaspheming against Moses and against God. Acts chapter 6. He says, they stubborned him, the men, which said, we have had him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And the next verse says, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came up to him. Again, you see, the scribes, the elders, those old guys, they came upon him, caught him, and brought him to the council. And then they set up false witnesses, which says, this man causes not to speak blasphemous, sorry, not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And the next verse says, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered. The moment the virus is here, you're touching Moses' customs. And this is the amazing thing about this. The next verse says that and all that sat in the council, they looked steadfastly at the boy, and they saw his face, and it had been the face of an angel. They could see the glory of God upon his life, but he had touched the customs. End of story. They stoned the man. Because for them you raise dead, open blind eyes, shine like a star, fly in the sky. Do all you want, go on flying horses. You do anything you want. We don't give a damn. Touch the customs, we kill you. Some people can die for tradition. Above revelation. One time many years ago I was walking somewhere. And then, you know, like you trip, boom. And then I said, yes, 
And then a little girl said, ah, 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 Jesus. Then I said, I thought the conversation was going to end there. So I said, you say, I say yes, you say yes, but we're talking about the same body. He says, no, 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 we are not talking about the same person. You, you are talking about Yesu, but me, I know Yesu. You understand what I'm saying? We argued for five minutes of whether he's Jesus or Yesu. You understand what I'm saying? Because for her, if it's not a V, he's not Jesus. It's like I've seen people who say, in my name you shall cast out devils, right? And then somebody gets a tradition like, for you to cast out a devil, you have to say, in the name of Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, in my name you shall cast out. He didn't say, every time you want to cast out, you have to say, in the name of Jesus. Now, when we cast out devils and we don't say, in the name of Jesus, they, they touch each other. Under which spirit is he casting out devils? <laughs> My point is, be free to say in the name of Jesus, and be free when you don't say. Yes, but you have to say. No, you show me why it says you shall say. No, he says in my name, in my name. So we say, when we say in the name of Jesus, we speak in the revelation of in his name. But even if I don't say in the name of Jesus, and I say, you spirit of darkness, loose. It has to lose her. Even if I don't say, in, but some of you, your traditional brain tells you, if you don't say in the name, it will not work. <laughs> Who saw the sun set free? It's free indeed. Somebody shout hallelujah. Some have embraced cultural tradition. You're born again, but your culture sometimes overrides your revelation of Jesus. For example, in Buganda, there's a thought that uh, a son-in-law is not supposed to shake the hand of the mother-in-law. How many of you have heard of it? Hey, Tomusiga Buchi. Buko. Now some of you are born again. You get to church and say, Rabba Kosha. Shikaraba. Then you see your mother-in-law and then you say, Praise God. <laughs> what are you doing? Am I making sense? And the Bible says that little living can cause you to error, a big error. Praise the Lord Jesus. It's okay to celebrate your culture. You're a prince, you're a princess. You understand? It's wonderful for you to belong to a family and the royal family. It's wonderful for you. But you have a boundary where you... If, if, also, they find you... Chandando, mugenyagenda, chandanda. You understand? And you're, you're saying bye to the judge. People are like... Eh? You know, you know these things are cultural. I'm also not telling you to set yourself against culture. Because I've never seen men who set themselves against culture and they win. God has not called us to reject the whole lot. Because not all culture, not all culture is wrong. How many of you know that? Not all of it is wrong. But God has called the church to redeem culture. Because the people we reach out to are cultural. We are called to redeem, not to reject. No, no, no. We, we, we are called to see the wrong parts and help correct them. Because if we lose the people, because we are so much rejecting the culture, we might end up losing the picture of why Jesus sent us. What he has only instructed us is not to compromise our standards in the faith. For example, in the Uganda culture, they some they call Kuchala. Kuchala is different from Kwanjula. How many of you know that? Kuchala is the first time I think parents meet each other on behalf of the couples that are going to get married, right? And Kwanjula is the official one where even the cousins and uncles come. The reason why parents meet each other primarily is to make sure that you avoid incest, isn't it? They ask you the names of your grandfathers and all of them just to make sure that you're not marrying your cousin's sister or your sister, Okay. Now, that is cultural, but it's not wrong. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? So, we are not against culture. We are called to redeem culture, but we're also 
called not to compromise with things that might bring in demonic worship without us even knowing that we are doing demonic worship in the name of I am a Muganda. No, listen, you're born again. You are born again. Praise God. You're what? You're born again. That is above your tribe. When you become born again, your DNA changed. There's a very interesting concept about humans that many people do not know. How many of you are familiar with a field called epigenetics? <laughs> Scientists have discovered eh, that your thoughts, right? This is general, it's in the scripture, right? Scripture, as a man thinks, so it is, right? Your thoughts shape your genes. They can actually shape your genes. They can change the order of your genes. You understand what I'm saying? And those genes can be passed on to your child through sperm and over. Now, scientists have proved that your child can think the way you used to think a certain way. This is even funny. Now, when you renew your mind through the reading of the word, do you know what you're doing to your child? Do you know what you're doing to your children's children? Do you see that blessing that is for a thousand generations? Because the, the faith that is in unity, the faith that is in life, is the same faith that is in Timothy. Some of you, there are things you have to kill in your generation so that they don't cross over to the next. If you're conscious that in your family you get asthma, eh? you, that thought alone will pass the asthma gene on your child. Just the thought that you pass asthma, you have asthma. For us in our family, we have asthma. That contact, and I'll teach about it, it it's very funny when you study neuroplasticity. The way the brain works is very funny. The way you think, when you start thinking, for us in our family, we get heart disease. In our family, for us, all of us get diabetes. When you accept it in your head that in your family you get diabetes, you have already transferred that diabetic gene in your child. Because as a man thinker, so he is. When you hold a tradition, you pass it on through sperm. Praise God. So, when Paul is speaking in Galatians, for example, he realizes that in Jerusalem, there was Judaism. Judaism was the biggest chunk of it tradition than Revelation. That's why in Galatians 1 and 11, he's saying that, but I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after a man. Listen. For neither received it I of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 17 says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and I returned into Damascus. The reason why Paul did not go to Jerusalem to study was because the Lord was leading him away from the traditions of the forefathers. Some people have used that scripture to say, you don't need anyone to teach you. Some people have used that scripture to mean to say that everybody who is apostolic, called in the apostolic office, they don't need to go to Jerusalem because they think everything in Jerusalem is wrong. Listen to me. Jerusalem, in Paul's time, there was a lot of Judaism and there was a lot of tradition and God wanted to separate Paul from tradition into the person of Jesus Christ through the revelation of that person. That does not necessarily mean that you cannot be taught by a man or that you cannot go and confer with a man or compare notes and see what the Lord is speaking to you. If indeed that man is called of God and is not traditional, or if you believe that that man is sound in the spirit, he's fervent. Now we have people who say, ah, like Paul, I, I didn't, I, no, no, no. Not all people will be like that. Some will be, but not all. Some will be, but not all. That's not a statement for all men. That's a statement for some men. Some men are honestly told of God. But some of you, it will be pride. Because it's not given you. Praise God, somebody. So, that is why Paul refuses to go to Jerusalem. Because God wants to reveal Christ to him. Not as the Christ he knows by his forefathers. For he says, for you know of my old ways. 
in my old tradition, he says, in the traditions of my father, he says, I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ and I wasted it. He says, you know my ways in conversations first in the Jewish religion, in the Amplified Constitution Judaism. How beyond measure I persecuted, I persecuted and abused the church of God furiously and extensively and with fanatical zeal did my best to make havoc of it and destroy it. When Paul was hitting them, he did not know he was actually hitting the church. For him, he thought he was serving God. That means the most dangerous people are people who behold traditions as the doctrine. Those ones can kill true men and women of God. These things you hear, people fighting fellow ministers, oh, that ministry is a cult. When you look behind them, you've simply gone the course against their tradition. If you used to enter church the way they enter it, and then do everything the way they do it, and then go to Bible school the way they want it, by the way, it's not these titles. It's the substance. You understand what I'm saying? You remember when Jesus is talking about the Pharisees who bear men with burdens that they themselves are not able to carry. Matthew 20, 3, 7. He says, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Praise God. Next verse. But all their work they do to be seen of men, they make broad their phallicateries and enlarge the borders of their garments. You know those kinds of people? And, and amazingly, when you see what is actually burdening people, it is actually the traditions that they impose on people without revelation. Somebody shout hallelujah. I wish you read it in the message. Now he says, instead of giving you God's law as food and drink by which you can banquet on God, instead of being defined by revelation, right? He says they package it in the bundles of rules, loading you down like pack animals. They seem to take pleasure in watching you stagger under these loads and wouldn't think of lifting a finger to help you. And their lives are perpetual fashion shows, embroidered prayer shows, one day and flowery prayers the next day, and they love to sit at the head table at the church dinners, basking in the most prominent positions, Printing in the radiance of public flattery, receiving honorary degrees, getting called Dr. Reverend. What? I'm not the one. The message Bible. Now, question. Is it wrong to be called Reverend? No. You understand? But it is wrong when you are Reverend, and then we, we want to listen, and you are giving us tradition. Instead of the revelation of Jesus. It is not wrong to be called doctor. But it disturbs us when they call doctor. And the man comes on the pulpit. And he opens the Bible. And he's off the course. Those are the ones who are saying. If you don't go to school. You are not going to be a pastor. If you don't study theology for three years. We refuse you to be a pastor in the country. Mama. Mama. Kastakwa yaita Paulo. Listen. I advise people to study. I advise men of God to teach. And to be taught. Because novices are bringing a problem in the body of Christ. And I speak that from an apostolic office. That today we have drama in the church of Jesus because many are unskilled and unlearned, inexperienced in the doctrine of Jesus. But please do not even think for a moment that you want to impose it by force for every man to be taught the way you think they have to be taught because you think if they didn't go to your Bible school, therefore they don't know God. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Some people are honestly taught of God. And we have seen men who have gone to Bible school and still erred. You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? They are blaming a man for selling rice at 50k when they are selling rosaries at 100,000. Whoa! Indulgences. Praise God. My point is, Jesus builds the church. What is not of Jesus? Let me give them the wisdom of Gamaliel. 
it shall go. But don't be a part of it going. God has enough power to without any nonsense. Are you following me? God has all power to weed out the wrong element. But please, brethren, Christian believers, avoid thinking that God has called you to correct the church of Jesus. That big brother syndrome is going to bring trouble. You did not call these men. You don't even know at what stage they are at. Maybe they are the part where Peter was a couple of years before when Jesus told him, I see the devil shift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith failed in not. I didn't send you back to where you're supposed to to go and read this. No. He, he told him, I have prayed for you. Where do you think they are? You who doesn't know the state of their heart and relationship before God. Maybe they're even in their errors, but at a particular point, God is going to visit them at a certain corner and bring salvation to them. It is not our business to restore the fallen. It is our business to pray for them. God is the one who will touch their hearts and restore them. If we should restore them, the Bible has taught us how. It tells us in a spirit of meekness and gentleness. Least you yourselves be tempted. He hasn't called us to impose and regulate. We are not God. We are not God. Praise God. The church of Jesus, you cannot regulate faith. You can't regulate faith. You can't regulate the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You can't regulate. That's a physical attempt to fix a spiritual issue. That's error already. The church of Jesus will be sorted by him himself. He says on this rock, I will build my church. And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Mutujeko tradition. Somebody said hallelujah. Colossians 2.8, he says, See to it that no one carries you off. Beware lest any man spoils you. Give me the Amplified. He says, See to it that no one carries you off or spoils or makes you yourselves captive by his so-called philosophy and intellectualism and vain deceit, idle fancies and plain nonsense, following human traditions, men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world, just crude notions following the rudimentary and elemental teachings of the universe and disregarding the teaching of Jesus Christ. And in verse 20 it says, If then you have died, if then you have died with Christ, to material ways of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elemental notions, teachings of externalism. Why do you live as though you still belong to the world? Why do you submit yourselves to rules and regulations such as? He says, do not handle this. Do not test this. Do not even touch them. Don't do this. Referring to the things of all which perish with being used. To do this is to follow human precepts and not the teachings of Jesus, but human precepts and doctrines. That, that's what it means to do it. And the next verse says, and he says, such practices have indeed the outward appearance that popularly passes for wisdom in promoting self-imposed rigor of devotion and delight in self-humiliation and severity of discipline of the body, but they are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh, the lower nature. And instead, they do not honor God, but they serve only the indulgence of the flesh to make you feel that you're better than others because you honor certain traditions and the rest of them are not as good as you are because they're not doing the things the way you're doing them. I don't have a problem if you dress a certain way. Put on your collar. You look wonderful. Preach. But please, don't disqualify me because I've not put on a collar. Don't. We have wonderful suits. We put them on wonderful. But please don't disqualify a minister because he has not put on a suit. No. The Bible speaks of modest dressing. Modest meaning... You're not dressing to stumble. That's what the Bible speaks about. Those suits are American. They are British. You understand what I'm saying? Even if I put on a council, which is supposed to be local, they'll say, ah, he has come to do witchcraft. <laughs> Traditions. That's why sometimes we put on our jeans. You understand what I'm saying? So that they will know that the gospel and the power is not in suits. It's not in ties. It's not in the height of your cut. It is not in the cologne of the Louis Vuitton. It is in Jesus Christ. The revelation of the person of Jesus. I've also realized some dress just because they have a low esteem. When they put on a suit, they are enough. Listen, 
in Jesus all things consist. Whether I'm putting on a tie or I'm not putting on the tie, He is the fullness that fills all things and is in me. In Him I live and move and have my own being. I'll make a lame man walk whether I'm putting on white or purple. It doesn't make me more glorious. No. The tie doesn't make me more glorious. It only makes me smarter. And sometimes I want to look smarter. But for that young man who thinks that you have to put on a certain way for people to say you're a man of God. That's why Jesus will appear to some of you putting on jeans and you'll... You'll throw him away. Tell your neighbor traditions. Praise God. It has apparently been revealed that many times we start to talk about tradition. Many times people who are traditional usually incline to the law. I don't know why, but those are like brother and sister, students and books. Galatians chapter 3 verses 18. Give me the amplified of this. He says, now he's giving an example. He's giving an example. Of law versus grace. Huh? He says, if the inheritance of the promise depends on observing the law, as these false teachers would like you to believe, they say it is no longer depends on the promise. However, God gave it to Abraham as a free gift solely by virtue of his promise. You see that? Some people think that for you to get the promise, let me just show you one of the most hidden traditions in the church of Jesus. That pass for revelation. Pass for revelation. They pass for revelation. Paul gives us a very interesting thing here. He says that the inheritance that you and I carry of the promise, he asks, does it depend on what you do or it depends on faith because it's a free gift? And he says, Abraham was given to that as a free gift. It was a free gift to Abraham. He did not receive the promises because of what he did. He received the promises because of who he believed solely. And now the next verse says that what then was the purpose of the law? It was added later on, right, after the promise to disclose and expose to men their guilt because of the transgressions and to make men more conscious of the sinfulness of sin. That's what the law does. It only shows you the sinfulness of sin. It shows you how bad sin is. The law is not there to save you. The law is there to show you sin is bad. HV TV. Like our late revivalist, Simeon Tulambi said. That wonderful man. You understand? Now, the Bible says, and it was intended, the law was intended to be in effect until the seed that is the descendant of the heir, should come and concerning to whom the promise had been made. And if the law was arranged and ordained and appointed through the instrumentality of angels and was given by the hand in person of a God between, which is Moses, the intermediary person between God and man. So Moses was the middle person. This is man, this is God. Moses was here in the middle. And the Bible says, now a God between, when they're talking about Moses or anybody who is an intermediary, has to do with and implies more than one party, there can be no mediator with just one person. Yet God is only one person, and he was the sole party in giving that promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel. Its validation was dependent on both. Now he continues to say, is the law then contrary and opposed to the promises of God? He says, of course not. If a law had been given which could convert spiritual life, right? then righteousness and right standing with God would certainly have come by the law. That means there is no law that can give life. It's not there. So why do you put yourself under a rule, a regulation, a law, an ordinance that cannot give life? No law can give life. Nothing can give life. That means when I tell you, don't steal. I'm not giving you life. I'm just showing you the sinfulness of stealing, but I don't give you the life not to steal. Are you following me? Now, the next verse says, but the scriptures picture all mankind as sinners and shut up and imprisoned by sin. He says the, the scripture has confined all under sin. All men in the flesh are sin. All men in the flesh are sin. 
That is why you, you remove that self-righteous attitude of me, I'm better than that person because I didn't eat pork and he ate it, and I'm better than that sister because for her she lied last week, me, I haven't lied. Don't be funny. Don't be funny. You are with sin like anybody else in the flesh. The difference between us believers and anybody, the people outside, is because we have received the free justification, which is by faith in Christ. Are you following me? Now, the Bible says, the scriptures, scripture, all mankind are sinners, shut up and imprisoned by sin, so that the inheritance, the blessing, which was promised through faith in Jesus the Messiah, might be given, released, listen, delivered and committed to all those who believe, who adhere and trust and rely on Jesus Christ. Now, meaning, your inheritance is not based on performance. It is based on faith. You understand what I'm saying? It's based on receiving faith. It's not based on your works. The law was only added to show you your sinfulness. It wasn't there in any way to even contribute to anything as of to the inheritance. Until the time appointed for the seed, which is Jesus, to come in the flesh and die and come in the likeness of a man in the form of a servant. And he sheds his blood for you and I. But now inheritance is by faith in him, not of works. Traditionally, it's not so. Today we tell people, tithe. You tithe. If you tithe, God will bless you. That's a traditionally wrong teaching. Traditionally wrong teaching. Also, what do you mean? Let me explain what I mean. Men don't tithe to be blessed. Men tithe because they are blessed. And the things that follow after are simply manifestations of that blessing. Have I made sense? We don't give just that we will become rich. We are rich and that is why we give. And when the manifestation comes and God blesses us physically, that is simply a physical manifestation of the spiritual blessing in Christ before we even get. Are you following what I'm saying? You're not good because of what you've done. Are you following me? And God is not going to reward you according to the good that you've done. God rewards you according to the good that you are because you believe in him to make you good, even before you become good. And so you receive the acts of goodness as a result manifestation of the goodness that you have before you did good. That is why it says in Romans, Come at this blessedness unto the circumcised or unto the uncircumcision. Does it come before circumcision or after circumcision? Let me say, we say that faith was reconned to Abraham for righteousness. And the Bible asks us in the next verse, how was it then reconned? Was it reconned when he was in circumcision, doing good stuff, or in uncircumcision? And the Bible says, righteousness was counted on him, not in circumcision but in uncircumcision. That means God counted Abraham right before he did right. Our traditional men call you right because you've done right. God calls you right even before you do right. And the next verse says, and he received, listen, the sign of circumcision doing right as a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all of them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Common sense. You're not a bad man trying to be good. Some of you, even your confessions are silly. I know I'm bad, but I'm trying. That's traditional. No, say I'm good. And I'm walking in goodness. But you see, we are seeing things that are not right in your life. Yes, those things are not right. But God has counted righteousness on me, not based on circumcision, but based on uncircumcision. And I will receive circumcision as a seal of the sign of the righteousness that I had while yet I was uncircumcised. Simply put, 
this is the order. God calls you righteous. He imputes righteousness on you. He calls you the best thing there is. When you steal the most potent thing they know. And he continues imputing things on you. Because he calls it the things that are not as though they are. That's the principles of, 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 of restoration. He doesn't call you a thief. He calls you the most faithful. Even when you're still a thief. And he continues imputing it on you. He says you're not a thief. He says you're not a thief. He says you're not a thief. And as he continues to speak it upon your life, you receive the seal of not being a thief. You stop stealing as a seal, as a confirmation it's a confirmation of the thief that you are not when you are still a thief. Ati take a take amba mina. So parents, when your child fails in class, don't you now look at this stupid kid. No. Say my child, you are so so wise. You're wise. You're very wise. Then if you get that and get 20, you say you are wiser than I thought. Impute righteousness. Are you hearing me? Get to a point in your marriage where your husband annoys you and you say, look at the most wonderful man in the world here, messing me up. <laughs> Calling the things that are not as though they are. Hallelujah. I'm a success. I'm going upward and upward only. I'm victorious. I'm righteous. I am wise. I'm glorified. And as you continue speaking and believing and imputing, you start receiving circumcision as a seal of the sign, as a seal of righteousness, of the faith which you had while you are still uncircumcised. So when he says, you shall do signs, miracles, and wonders, that's one. He says, you receive the sign of circumcision. You understand? When I walk right, it's a sign that I'm righteous. It's not my righteousness. It's a sign that I'm righteous. But it's not my righteousness. I'm not righteous because I did right. Devil, I'm not righteous. Now, this thing annoys Satan. Eh? This thing annoys Satan. To know that God still calls you righteous. It kills him. That is why they fight Fanero. They don't fight Fanero because we have done all those things they are saying. No. It is because we are simply saying, You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. One man wrote and then he was attacking me. He says, and there's this little apostle young man who doesn't even understand. He says, if you sin, say I'm the righteousness of God. What kind of nonsense is that? I said, oh my God. Did he just call the testimony of Jesus nonsense? Did he just trample on the stand of God and the blood that was purchased and the righteousness that was imputed upon him and the rather the righteousness of God without the law is witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. And to all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and have been justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The devil hates that line. All have sinned. Present continuous and fall short of the glory of God, but have been justified free. That's what hurts the devil most and those people. Because for them, they, they don't want to accept that God holds no charge on you. This is what I've realized about grace. When you know how much free and justified you are, that what gets into you and causes you to manifest the sign of walking right because of the righteousness that you have. God first calls it and it becomes because the tongue has power. If he tells you life and death are in the power of the tongue, why do you think he would kill you with his own tongue? Why would he call you mad? Why would he call you wild? 
why would he call you prostitute? If he knows that life and death are in the power of his tongue, why would he kill you with his tongue? He can only bless you with his tongue. Because he knows whatever he pronounces on you, you start to become it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There are people who messed up so bad in their past that they don't think God will ever use them or there will ever be anything. You look at the list of the things you've done and you say, oh, If he comes, he comes. If he doesn't, then I'll be fine. I have good news for you. Even the worst sin mentioned in Scripture, he says nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. You can make all these mistakes, God forbid, but God will wash you himself, separate you himself, clean you himself. And this is the beauty about it. He throws everything to the ends of the earth and he does not remember it anymore. If God has forgotten it, you have no business remembering it or being reminded about it. Good news. If somebody comes and says, you, you used to steal, you tell him, darling, that is not me. I don't know that person. I'm a new creation in Christ. Behold, the old is past and now the new. And all things are of God. That is called spiritual warfare. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's called spiritual warfare. You know, I was sharing with people one time and I told him the spirit of religion never forgets. If you stole in 65, you're forever going to be a thief. If you messed up in 72, you'll never preach again. That generation is passing out. Because it has to give way for the grace of God that gets men, washes their mistakes, and still uses them. And the latter is greater than the former. And they are finishing is of the Lord. I have good news for you. There is nothing you have done that God can't take away, that God can't erase out of the history of the world as is known. It can stay in the minds of those who knew you, but if your mind condemns you, the Bible says God is greater than your mind. If our hearts condemn us, praise the Lord, God is greater than our hearts. He will still use you. That story will end there and you'll be a success in the mighty name of Jesus. And you will finish well to God be the glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. Raise your hands and thank God for grace. Come on, just speak in tongues. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and speaks for me, whoever lives and speaks for me. Can beat me deeper. No man can beat me deeper. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me over, he'll be Oh. 
you hold the word of God above the traditions of men. I decree and I declare that you will not fail in this life. Whether it be an attack on your life, whether it be an addiction, whether it be a struggle, whether it be a challenge, whether it be a trial and a temptation, I have news for you that you have overcome by Christ who strengthens you. Greater, greater, greater is he which is in you than he that is in the world and he that began a good work in you he shall see to accomplishment to the day of Christ he is the author and the finisher of your faith he is the beginning and the end he is your alpha and your omega he is your nisi, your shama your rohi, your sidukenu he is your everything and he shall sustain you until the end he shall hold you up on that day he will deliver you from anything that you're struggling from you walk out of any witness you walk out of any trouble you walk out of any hate you walk out of any rage you walk out of any disease you walk out of any distress any disaspiration any stress any struggle i decree and i declare that your body is submitted to the word of god your mind is submitted to the word of god your soul is submitted to the word of god you're walking righteous you're receiving the sign of circumcision as the seal of the righteousness that you had while you were not uncircumcised inheritance is yours the promise is yours glory is yours love is yours victory is yours understanding is yours and your end shall be greater than your past don't doubt it clap your hands to jesus come on clap your hands to jesus thank you lord jesus if you're here and you've never given your life to jesus how can you refuse him? I want you to come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He said tonight, I want that light. Repeat these words after me. Say, Jesus, I receive you tonight as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died and rose again for my sins. Tonight, my life changes. I receive you and I'm changed forever. The old is past. I begin a new chapter with you, in you. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041 466 
or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.